It's Talk Funny, a podcast by Mark Bailey and other comics from all over. We ended up in Japan because, unlike every other country in the world, apparently people here like the season known as spring. Who knew? The Talk Funny podcast from Nagoya Radio.com and Nagoya Comedy. Here's Mark Bailey. And welcome back to another edition of Talk Funny. I'm Mark Bailey. We're here with Steve Howard. Hello. The John Gotti Social Club is closed now, but they had a, uh, a jam session, which was very fun. I went to it. They had a lot of musicians there, and I was there, too. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I played drums for Nirvana. It smells like Teen Spirit, which is very, very difficult. Dave Grohl is a god. Yeah. Dave, you don't have to make it so difficult. Just play <laughs> drums. When I play your song, I mean, that's the thing with drummers is, like, if you're a guitarist and you play... A Hendrix tune, you can't do exactly what Hendrix did, so you might tone it down a little bit, and you do your own style. But drummers are not allowed to do their own style if they're doing a cover. Mm. They have to do Dave Grohl's drumming, which is very, very difficult for someone who's out of shape and doesn't play (laughs) drums every day. So that was a lot of fun for me. One of the guys in the band is a former, you know, I run 10 businesses, former English teacher of mine. We're friends now, Mm -hmm. but he got fired because... He, I warned him over and over again. He was going to a juku. It's kind of a prep school for mm-hmm. colleges here that a lot of high school kids have to go to and junior high kids. And he was late every time. Mm-hmm. And the owner is a very nice Japanese guy. called me up and said, I just he's, he's making me late for my classes. He's also late for his classes, but I have to pick him up at the station. We're both late. We're late mm-hmm. for both classes, and it's hurting my bottom line. And so I warned him three times. Then... He kept being late, and so the Japanese guy said, can you replace him quietly and don't tell him he's fired yet until we get a replacement? Mm -hmm. So I didn't, and then, funny thing, when the guy heard from his replacement, you know, first of all, a a new guy shows up and he's supposed to train. That's not obvious at all, (laughs) but he has to train because it's very difficult to do this. If we fire you, you have all the textbooks, so that's basically how you replace someone. You remember when I was at this other university, back when I had two classes, and then this year I have one class. Mm. Remember that gerbil that they had there every day when I was there? <laughs> Turns out the gerbil got my other class. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not there at all now, so right. <laughs> I guess the, <laughs> the parrot in the, in the corner, I guess he got your job. <laughs> uh, and so the funny thing is I told this guy, we'll call him Bob, and I said, Bob, are we going to have to let you go? He said, yeah, I, I asked you last week or if you were going to replace me. And you didn't tell me. And he said, you know, you should have told me earlier because the timing is very important. I said, oh, it's funny that you mentioned timing. <laughs> oh, so timing. He said, if you had told me earlier, I could have gotten a next job lined up. And I said, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned timing because that's why you got fired. <laughs> Remember what I said three times in a row that's very important what time you show up? He said, yeah, I understand that. But you should have told me earlier. And I said, okay, it seems like we both have issues about time. <laughs> but the reason that you, you didn't get time to find other work is because you didn't keep your promise about time to us. So the funny thing is, I walk in, he's doing keyboards, and I said, hey, Bob, you're in a band? He goes, yeah. And I said, I didn't know you could keep time. (laughs) And I just had to get that in there. (laughs) We've talked about writing comedy for Uh stand-up. There's other comedy forms, novels, parodies, which, of course, I do. So Uh what what are your thoughts on on the different forms, and how are they different? How is it different writing? Um, Well, recently, I've been working with uh, uh, Tim... Uh, Lenane, who's been on the show several times, but uh, we're, we're working on a screenplay for a movie, which is, um, you know, um, uh, a uh, comedy is very, very different from uh, writing um, just, you know, writing jokes to do uh, um, stand up comedy. Uh, I, I come from a, a, a novelist background, so I kind of, you know, that the, I know how to structure a story and stuff and create characters and write dialogue, but, uh, but screenplay is also very different from writing a novel as well, so. Uh, been doing that uh, recently. It, uh, been a real uh, learning a lot about that style of writing versus um, writing other types of comedy. There's a very famous book. You probably I don't remember the author. You may know. I think it's kind of a pinkish book. How to write a screenplay in 30 days. Oh yeah. <laughs> I never met anyone who's written one in 30 days. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I bought it 10 years ago, and I'm yeah. still working on it. Supposedly, Sylvester Stallone wrote the the first script for the first Rocky in 72 hours. Um, but this was late 70s, and there was a lot of cocaine around, so maybe, you know. <laughs> right, right. So I do a lot of stuff with parodies, and I did mm-hmm. it out of necessity from when I was in radio. Yeah. I had just had to have a lot of filler. Mm-hmm. And so I would hear songs. I think I mentioned it before. I can't remember if it was off mic or not. One time my, my clueless, ditzy boss, who hated radio, knew nothing about it, and hated music. And she, why is she the program director? <laughs> Head janitor wasn't available. <laughs> She's screwing the boss? Oh, she is. Okay. All right. So I now understand it. And she would 
say something to me. You know, I said, I'm doing all the work here. And then when I introduce myself, I don't have a, a Macy. I don't have a business card. Hmm. I'm the one-man engineer. I, uh, this station was off the air one morning in the snow. I put it back on the air by myself without hmm. the engineers. I write, produce, and narrate, and pick all the music and do everything for my four-hour morning drive show hmm. with no staff. <laughs> and that's not talent. I don't know what is. Yeah. And she said, well, you don't get Macy yet. So then I bought him and turned over drive. Baby, 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 you don't get Macy yet. So I immediately <laughs> went in the studio, and I made that parody, and I played it on the air. <laughs> and then the next day, she said, I noticed that you're starting to write songs every time we have a meeting. You've got to stop <laughs> doing that because I'm trying to help you. It's more than a memo. More than a memo. <laughs> Gives me comedy material for the next thousand years. <laughs> I think I still have these. And mm. I was thinking... I'm not the only one that has to deal with childish bosses and snotty memos and warnings. Because you were just telling me just the other day, how, you know, how much you hate your bosses. And, and so there's ridiculous memos and things have been said to you. So I know that you agree with me. <laughs> and so today we're going to do it for the working man. Okay? So this is for, um, we have our, our big time ice dream band, as we sometimes do. They've been busy writing a song to appeal to... Um, the working man, people that have to deal with real, real boneheads for superiors. What's the name of the band? Well, they're calling themselves Boss Hall. It's more than a warning. More than a warning. We can be material for the next seven years. My boss is a moron. Boss is a moron. Has no experience and acts like a good child. It's more than a warning. Once again, that was uh, Boss Hole. Thank you very much, guys. That was very good. Yeah, that was for the working man. And then she'll say, um, you've really got an attitude. I bet you think this show is about you. <laughs> You're so vain. I bet I think this show is about me. I'm so vain. I bet I think this show is about me. Don't I? Don't I? I'm the only one here. Don't I? <laughs> and so that just comes naturally to me. And it's kind of probably also because I'm a language nerd. And when I hear a, a pattern of a sentence, uh -huh. like almost any sentence you can say, it will remind me of something. Uh, I Touch Myself is a famous song from the 80s. I Touch My Cell Phone. I mean, I immediately come up with yeah. these. That's a little different from stand-up because basically a parody is a premise, and then you could put in punchlines, but it doesn't have to have a punchline. Usually the premise is the punchline right. for writing parodies. But what's the process for um, screenplay? I would imagine it would be a much slower premise. Yeah. And uh, what about the punchlines? Well, so with with a screenplay, because it, you know eventually it's hopefully going to be a movie, So so as far as like... Other than if you write in any physical comedy, um, any sort of jokes that are, are basically going to be in the dialogue. And the dialogue for a movie has to somewhat sound like a, a natural conversation. So when you're doing stand-up, of course, you know, it's, it's premise, setup, joke. So it doesn't necessarily, you're, you're talking to the audience, but you're not really having a conversation. Whereas with uh, screenplay, what I've noticed is because it's dialogue, two or more people talking, it it, there's got to be something in there funny, parts in it that are going to be funny, but at the same time, it has to sound like they're having a natural conversation at the same time. I've noticed, I listen to, when I watch movies, uh, David Chase and The Sopranos, mm -hmm. they've got a lot of jokes in there. Yeah, yeah. He calls them jokes, but your normal population is not going to even recognize them. The right. only people that recognize them as jokes is usually comedians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a good example is in Goodfellas yep. by Martin Scorsese. For me, one of the funniest jokes was when they're both crying because she flushed the cocaine down the <laughs> toilet. <laughs> and that's the worst thing that ever happened to Henry Hill. <laughs> He's had death threats. <laughs> He's been threatened. He almost died a couple of times. He could get whacked any moment. He could yeah. go to prison. He's been in prison, and I've never seen him cry harder than <laughs> when <laughs> he had to work for a living. He said, now we got to work right. for a living. <laughs> that's the funniest, you know, one of yeah. the funniest punchlines. Yeah. But it's not really a punchline. You couldn't mm. get up on stage and tell that. No. Huh. And another one is in a Woody Allen movie. Woody Allen has a lot of them. He just yeah plants and he'll say something to someone like uh, you know you'd like sex if you tried it it's like marriage except it's fun <laughs> and, and it just goes you know but he talks yeah. so fast and right. people mistake that for just dialogue yeah but you know they put that in there those are zingers and David Chase 
I really recommend if you have the Sopranos DVDs, listen to the director's cut yeah. and his comments. Mm-hmm. But he talks about the sometimes the music is in the scene and mm-hmm. sometimes it's piped in a basically kind of plugged in music where uh-huh. The guys in the scene don't hear that music that you're hearing. Dun, right. dun, 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 yeah. dun. They didn't hear that in Jaws when they yeah. were swimming. They yeah. didn't hear that, right? Yeah. That'd be weird if you heard it. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> they should probably have that, you know. But the shark's David, got a boombox. <laughs> David Chase, that shark's from the 70s. But David Chase, he, he liked to use a lot of real music, what mm-hmm. they listened to in the car in the oh, 80s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when a guy gets whacked in the 80s, yeah. that's the song that's playing, you yeah. know, whatever, and Journey and all of these things. Mm-hmm. That's actually playing on the jukebox yeah. when Tony does or doesn't get whacked. Mm-hmm. He'll go through these things that he wrote and he specifically planned it and he calls them jokes. Mm-hmm. But if I told them to you, they're not funny yeah. in that way. They're only funny in context. Mm-hmm. Is that hard to do? Are you? It's a little bit easier to, uh, I think, um, sort of um, make the dialogue sound funnier because of having the background now in stand-up. Um, I don't know if I would be as good at it if I was just doing it without without any without any uh, background in doing stand-up. So, uh, it, it you know, stand-up has helped me a lot for this. When I started my radio job here in the 2000, I did some other stuff at other stations, but my, my big responsibility, the one that paid for my house, that was a full-time job, but it only took me took me four hours on air but it took me four hours of pre-prep before and two hours after so it was a full-time job but I started writing my screenplay and it was going to be fiction it was going to be autobiographical about me but then in the things that happened at that radio station were funnier than any of the things (laughs) I had thought of in my screenplay Uh that I turned it into just a non-fiction because the nonfiction was funnier yeah. than anything you could have come up with. I would have never come up with this in a novel. My ditzy program director, she came in with another great idea, and she said, she picked my guests, and I hated jazz, and she knew that, <laughs> and she picked jazz guests as much as she could. Hmm. And one day she said, I've got good news. You don't have jazz musicians today. I said, what kind of musicians? She said, um, you've got 30 Hawaiian dancers. <laughs> and I said, okay, what kind of musicians? <laughs> no, just the dancers. There's no music? Well, they brought, yeah, they brought a CD. <laughs> Okay, I'll just play the CD then, <laughs> and I'll hawk their show. She said, no, they're going to dance live on the radio. And I said, where's the cameras? Are you doing a bit? Who's the comic here, you know? No, really, what are they going to do? No, they're going to dance. She said, you can hear them. They have the, the hula skirts. You can hear that. And I said, why don't I just get some maracas? I said, no, seriously. And she goes, yeah, so promote that. So I promoted it just ridiculously, and I said, you know, sound is overrated on radio. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is, we got a mime coming up. <laughs> I'll do most of the talking, don't worry. And then I, I turn it into a contest. You call in 12th caller, am I making this up or, or is it going to happen? You tell me, yes or no. And so the winner gets a CD of what I would or wouldn't play. Because I have the CD. I, I have the CD right here. Now, are we, is this going to happen? So we did the thing, mm. but nobody talked. And, they, and, and I said, can I interview one of the dancers? No, they dance. They don't talk. <laughs> okay, on radio. You know, this is radio, right? <laughs> they didn't even stream on the internet at the time. So we did this. It's just, so 80% polls said, I think you're making this up. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. We gave away a prize. And I said, to prove to you, now I'm going to get the mastermind. And she was proud of it. The mastermind. My boss. Here's Hiroko. So she got on. She goes, well, it was very beautiful. It was nice, and you know, I said, I guess you had to be here for radio. <laughs> and she didn't realize I'm just lampooning her for 28 minutes. And people wrote in and said, funniest thing I've ever heard on radio. <laughs> you know, and so I ripped up my novel because nothing's going to compare to the crap that I had. One time she came in, she goes, 10 minutes before I'm off the air, there's a couple of musicians from Sony, and they're sitting in the lounge, and we forgot to schedule they were supposed to be on your show because you play a lot of rock. I said, well, who is it? She goes, I forgot the name of the band. It's Lars. <laughs> Lars Ulrich? <laughs> yeah. And she goes, let me find the other. I said, I don't care who the other guy is. Get him in here. Get him in here now. Oh, she goes, you know Lars? Yes. Oh, Good thing it wasn't John, you know. John Bon Jovi? No, John Petty. I don't know. They came in and they're like, you're the first guy. We, we did this live. They said, you know who we are? I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm a rock program. I'm, I'm the only guy that plays rock. Mm. And he goes, we thought it was a joke. We thought Sony was joking with us because they made us sign our names and then she looked us up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, for my boss, can you say it very slowly, the name of your band? Metallica. 
Oh. And so that's another one. And later she goes, well, we're lucky that you were here, that you knew that. Yeah, lucky that somebody knows what radio is. And she goes, yeah, it's important to Sony. Yeah, I think it yeah. is important to Sony.